So we've been uh, uh, kind of bumping up against health reform uh, during the entire conference. Uh, NACI will be having a, uh, likely will be having a, a conference just on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, so being both cognizant of the fact that NACI will be doing the usual bang up job of getting the best people uh, in, in Washington and around the country to talk about health reform, we still didn't want to leave the topic untouched. Uh, and so we've put together a terrific uh, panel to uh, provide a kind of um, a broad overview of some of the issues. Some of you were at the morning session in which NACI rolled out a study panel uh, report, which I highly recommend to anyone interested in the health insurance exchange. It is the document to have. And those of you who have been following the health insurance commissioner reports, what NACI has done is basically taken that and built it out and up to show a kind of continuum of options. Um, and it really is, I think, going to turn out to be the go-to document for those folks really following and being involved in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Okay, so this is an important panel and I want to uh, get us going. Um, those of you who have followed uh, some of our great uh, uh, commentators like Will Rogers and John Stewart and others won't be surprised to know that there's a disconnect between the political debate in Washington and the realities on the ground all around us in the states and in the country. And healthcare reform presents one of the most extreme examples I can recall. Uh, we've got a debate in Washington about repeal, uh, and yet the reality is that in the states, you're finding medical providers, health insurers, um, uh, the uh, payers, the state governments, all working on implementation. Now, if you just followed the news, you would not really appreciate that. You would think that health reform was on the deathbed. And this panel is in part about uh, giving you an update of the vital signs, all of which are not even. This is really a lot of uncertainty, and there are some areas uh, where things are, are not moving forward. But there are other areas where they are moving forward, and so we want to uh, get into that. But I want to just start out with the warning uh, that uh, uh, what is going on in Washington and what you are reading in the press about health reform is not necessarily accurate. In fact, I, I keep thinking of uh, the famous British um, uh, commentator, Walter Bagehot, who talked about the theater of politics, and we've got really quite a theater going on. In any case, we've put together um, uh, a, a panel uh, with diverse perspectives, uh, representing, uh, we hope, uh, giving you a different, different uh, takes on what is going on on the ground in the country in terms of implementing health reform. It is a broad scope, and there may be a number of you who would like to go into more depth. Fortunately, we've got microphones and we can do that. But I just want to tell you that I've instructed the panelists to work at about 50,000 feet, maybe dropping down occasionally to about 25,000 feet. So if it seems general to you and you want more details, we're going to have a ton of time for questions. But from the starting point, because there are people here who are not really up to speed and won't know all the acronyms, we're going to start, I hope, at about 50,000, swooping down occasionally to 20,000 uh, feet. Um, now, we've given you uh, the bios, uh, so I'm not going to go through it in depth. But let me introduce our, our uh, panelists, each of whom will speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to uh, uh, come up and talk. Uh, Yvette Fontenot uh, currently serves as a senior policy director in the White House Office of Health Reform. Uh, she's coordinating the administration's work on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, next, Enrique uh, Martinez Vidal is the vice president of Academy Health and director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's state coverage uh, initiatives, which for those of you who are interested in health reform, is one of the, uh, the real players on the ground uh, in health reform. Uh, and he's got uh, really uh, an extensive background working with states on a whole variety of issues related to health care. So given the fact that health reform is in large part going to be what's going on in the states, um, uh, Enrique is a, 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 an important participant here. And then uh, Karen Ignani, who is the president and CEO of America's health insurance plans, uh, which represents and is the largest trade association for HMOs, network-based healthcare systems, and health and, and, and disability insurers. So it's a great panel. There'll be different perspectives, but it's really going to give you a sense of where we are in the implementation of health reform. Again, with the warning, don't pay attention to what's going on in Washington, or at least uh, take it with a pinch of salt 
Uh, let me uh, invite uh, Ms. Fontenot to come up first. Let's see here. And how do I just um, move this forward? Yes. Press the plus. No. I'll be up in a second. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here um, to discuss the steps the new law, the Affordable Care Act, has taken to help make our health care system better for everyone involved. Um, in January of 2010, none of us knew exactly what health reform was going to look like. Oh, I see it here, but not there. Okay. <laughs> Um, but now that the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land and we're uh, about 10 months into implementation, I'm proud to be here to tell you about the improvements that the new law is making in our health care system. So first I want to put the, the law into some context by briefly reminding you why the President believed that we had to reform our health care system. Second, I'm going to talk a little bit about the progress that we've made in implementing the law and what you can expect to see in the next few years. And finally, I'll address some of the challenges that we face and what the future holds for health care. <laughs> I'll just keep talking and <laughs> you guys can read it when it comes up. Um, so let's just spend one minute talking about when the president decided to tackle the health care crisis. When he took office, it was clear that the status quo was not an option. There was a set of facts and numbers that just could not be ignored. Growth in healthcare spending was headed towards a third of GDP by 2035 and nearly half in 2080. Total family premiums for employer sponsor, sponsored coverage had increased by 138% from 1999 to 2010. Yet the number of uninsured people had reached a disturbing 51 million in 2009. And despite spending two times what other industrialized countries spend on healthcare, we were not getting what we pay for. In fact, we have poor health outcomes. 15 million patients are injured in hospitals each year, sometimes by infections they develop in the hospital. Preventable medical errors cause as many as 100,000 deaths in hospitals per year. And outside the hospital, RAND researchers found that people were getting the recommended care from cl clinicians about half the time. The United States also scores among the lowest among advanced countries on key health indicators like infant mortality, obesity, and health system performance. So why is it that we have such poor health outcomes, even though we spend more than everyone else? A large part of the story is that the insurance markets that serve individuals and small businesses are broken. I'm getting the high sign here. So there we go. That's a good quote. We can read quickly. <laughs> um, OK, so this is uh, where we were. Um, Unlike large employers, individuals and small businesses have very little leverage, and most markets are dominated by one or two players, leaving small purchasers with few choices. So consequently, they've experienced double-digit premium growth almost every year in the past decade. So a lot of them just drop coverage, which is why um, we have fewer than half of businesses with less than 10 workers offer coverage. Under the old system, insurance companies often limit or deny coverage altogether to people with pre-existing conditions and impose restrictive annual or lifetime limits on how much they'll spend on the enrollee's care. All these ways that the failed insurance market has locked millions of Americans out of the system, imposing a high uncompensated care burden for everyone else. Caring for the uninsured and those who cannot afford the care they need cost the nation $43 billion in 2008, and it boosts the premiums of everyone who has insurance by more than $1,000 per family every year. So our health care system wasn't working for American families, businesses, or the government, and that's why the President and um, Congress worked so hard to pass the Affordable Care Act. The law lowers costs for families and businesses and gives them more control over their health insurance. It expands insurance coverage with private plan choices and tax credits to make coverage affordable. It establishes new state-based marketplaces called exchanges, which I understand you heard about this morning, to help consumers and small businesses shop for health insurance in a way that permits easy comparison of plans based on price, benefits, and quality. By pooling people together, reducing transaction costs and increasing transparency, exchanges create more efficient and competitive marketplaces for individuals and small employers. 
The insurance plans will offer basic but comprehensive benefits. In fact, the law requires that the secretary ensure that the scope of the essential health benefits is equal to the scope of benefits provided under the typical employer plan. The tax credits individuals and families use to purchase private coverage in the new exchanges, as well as the expansion of the Medicaid program, will ensure that 32 million more Americans have coverage. In addition, the law requires new insurance plans to cover recommended preventive care that could help prevent more serious costly illnesses without charging enrollees additional out-of-pocket costs. We've taken steps to make insurance markets more competitive and accessible with a new Patients' Bill of Rights that prohibits insurance companies from denying coverage to children with pre-existing conditions, prevents insurance companies from dropping your coverage when you get sick, restricts annual dollar limits on coverage and bans them altogether in 2014, and removes lifetime limits on coverage. All of these consumer protections are in effect today, and they make a difference in the lives of millions of Americans. The law improves quality, it reduces costs by rewarding providers for delivering high quality care and modernizing healthcare infrastructure. One particularly exciting creation of the law is the newly established CMS Innovation Center, which will be able to test new care delivery and payment ideas. That's music to the ear of many healthcare entrepreneurs who have wanted to test ideas like disease management and Medicare in the past, but have been stymied by the agency's lack of authority and new funding. So, where are we where are we on implementation? In 2010, we began expanding and stabilizing coverage for the Americans who most, when were most at risk of losing it, building a bridge to 2014 when the exchanges will be operational. We expanded coverage for people with pre-existing conditions through the pre-existing condition insurance plan in all 50 states, seniors by filling the Medicare prescription drug donut hole and providing free preventive benefits starting January 1, young adults who can now stay on their parents' plan until they're 26, early retirees through the new $5 billion reinsurance fund that's helping their former employers maintain their coverage, and small businesses who are receiving a small business tax credit for up to 35% of the cost of insuring their workers. And we've been moving to a new set of rules for the road for insurance companies and giving consumers more control. We've implemented the new Patients' Bill of Rights to remove lifetime and restrictive annual limits among other benefits, and requiring insurers to justify unreasonable rate increases and to spend at least 80% of every premium dollar on health care through the new medical loss ratio standards. In, li in line with the greater transparency we're bringing to the health insurance marketplace, we've launched healthcare.gov, a new consumer-friendly tool that's a one-stop shop for information on the Affordable Care Act. It's more than a website, it's a market-making mechanism that provides unprecedented transparency into the insurance market, inclu including detailed pricing information on individual market plans available in different states, so insurance options are at the consumer's fingertips. So in 2011 will be the year devoted to working with the states to build the new marketplaces or exchanges that will offer access to health plans for individuals and small businesses starting in 2014. So we've already begun this work in earnest. Early last fall, 48 states and the District of Columbia received substantial grants to begin work to plan their exchanges. We recently announced new competitive early innovator grants to fund states that lead the race to develop the necessary IT systems for state exchanges that can be deployed in other states. And we recently published a funding opportunity announcement that makes exchange establishment grants available to all 50 states, D.C., and the territories. And we're on track to meet the milestones that will allow state exchanges to begin enrolling consumers in mid-2013. In 2010, CMS is working in earnest with employers, hospitals, doctors, nurses, consumers, and leaders in the healthcare community to implement reforms to the delivery system that will make the healthcare system work better for patients and lower costs for, um, for everyone in the long run. And CMS is also on track to publish a regulation early this year setting forth the criteria for accountable care organizations, or ACOs, in Medicare. ACOs are models of care coordination where a clinical care team receives a bundled payment to provide and manage all the services needed by patients with certain conditions with the goal of improving outcomes. ACOs have the potential to make it easier for clinicians and hospitals to coordinate the care they provide, producing better results for patients at a lower cost. And we intend to build the ACO project on some of the successes that private health insurers have been developing. 
And if shared savings incentives are properly aligned, the Medicare ACO program will also encourage investment in health information technology and innovative ways of delivering care. In 2014, the exchanges will be operational, the in, and individuals and small businesses will be able to choose among plans. Tax credits and subsidies will be available to make coverage affordable and encourage healthier people to take up coverage. Medicaid will be expanded for the lowest income people. And once everyone is required to be in the system, we can eliminate the pre-existing condition exclusion that's made it so hard for sick people to get coverage. Offering affordable coverage through state-based exchanges, giving tax credits and subsidies to families. This rapid and fundamental change is creating exciting opportunities for business, including millions of new consumers for hospitals, health plans, and pharmaceutical companies, new financial incentives for hospitals and physicians to use health information technology, countless opportunities to develop products and services that improve care management, drive efficiency throughout the healthcare system. This is how the Affordable Care Act is helping drive our economy. Opportunities will also be available in designing exchanges, in prevention and wellness, in value-based insurance design, and in products like generic biologics. I'm proud of the effect that we've accomplished so much so far, and what's coming in the future will change the way patients get care, make patients safer, safer improve the quality and efficiency, and save money for consumers, employers, and the government. Still, as you just heard mentioned, um, there are some who want to repeal the law and go back to the days when families and businesses were hemorrhaging money without getting the quality health care they all deserved. Here are just some consequences of repealing the Affordable Care Act. More than 165 million Americans will again be exposed to lifetime limits. Some 16 million Americans will be at risk of losing their insurance. More than 2.7 million Medicare enrollees would lose prescription drug relief in the donut hole. More than 19 million middle-class Americans will lose tax credits to buy affordable coverage. 1.2 million young adults could lose coverage on their parents' plan. Hospitals will lose uncompensated care relief, and health plans and pharmaceutical companies will lose new customers. Repeal will increase the deficit by $230 billion this decade and by more than a trillion dollars in the following decade. And just repealing some of the key cost-saving measures in Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP would increase the deficit by $455 billion, according to the Congressional Budget Office. None of the opponents of the new law have produced a plan that will meaningfully help the American people the way the Affordable Care Act does. So what the future holds. Some people think that when a law is passed, the president signs it at the end of the process, the bureaucrats take, just take over. Not this president. This president has been deeply involved in implementation, from the development of the regulations embodying the Patients' Bill of Rights to working with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners on rate review and MLR standards. So he knows the strengths of the law and wants the benefits delivered to the American people expeditiously and carefully. At the same time, he said that he is willing to work with Democrats and Republicans who have ideas about how they can strengthen the law and the health care system for the American people. What we won't do, as he said, is go back to a system that wasn't working for American families and businesses and wasn't helping to put our government on a path of fiscal sustainability. So thank you again for having me, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in your conference. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, effect of the ACA on what states are, are taking on, the, their challenges and opportunities. Um, first, I need to do a little promo. Otherwise, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation takes my money away from me. Um, so, in case also, who, if you don't know who Academy Health is, uh, I'll let you know uh, about that. Uh, we're, a, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit, uh, professional uh, home for health services researchers and health policy makers. And the mission of our organization is really to bring those two worlds together, to bring good information, data, research to the policy makers so they make good decisions, and vice versa, talk to the policy makers and ask them what kind of research 
they need and go back to the policy, uh, go back to the researchers and say, could you please do some research on these issues? And um, so, and we, and, and I always see that state coverage initiatives, which is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded program, uh, is really an embodiment of, of that mission. We work with state policymakers to, to, uh, to, to, to expand coverage, to do uh, more broad health care reform. Now that the ACA has passed, it's really to work with them on, on implementation. You have our URL there. Uh, we're actually in the process of um, publishing our annual State of the States report. Uh, some of you may have seen in the past. Uh, hopefully that will be out in about two weeks. Um, so I have a, a, a few slides. Uh, uh, the good news is that I took a communications workshop that had PowerPoint as one of its uh, goals. The, the bad news is I think I failed that course. Um, there's probably too many words and no pictures and all the things that you're supposed to have in your slides. Um, but anyways, I won't go through every detail because we only have a limited amount of time and we want to get to the Q&A part. Um, but I'll, I'll talk broadly about what states are facing and then get into a little bit more detail about exchanges because that's really the huge focus right now. Um, so I don't want this to be Federal Reform 101, but here's a, a few notes. You probably know most of this. Uh, Medicaid and CHIP will expand by 2014 up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. Uh, there's a Federal, the federal, the fed, the, there will be a federal match of uh, starting at 100% um, for for those for those people, and then going down slowly to 90%. Um, there will be the exchanges. Uh, Yvette already started talking about those. We'll we'll get into more of those, I'm sure, with Karen as well. Uh, there is shared responsibility, uh, the individual mandate, uh, penalties for for uh, companies over 50 employees, um, and then there are also some insurance reforms as well that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more depth. Uh, so what's the backdrop of what's happening in states? Um, the, the, the clock is ticking. Um, some, some states are saying 2014 is tomorrow. Um, so there is an ambitious timeline. Uh, that's the word we use, like to use. Other people use unrealistic or crushing. Um, but um, we try to say ambitious. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really a delicate balancing act. I mean, if, when we speak with the folks in Massachusetts who has, have implemented a re, uh, some health reforms uh, after 24, uh, 2008, um, they really had very limited time frames. They said it was really brutal, but it was really helpful to actually have those really fast time, time frames and timelines to do it. Uh, there's a steep uh, learning curve. There's a lot of new ideas out there, new policy issues, new operational issues that states are need, needing to deal with. The, the state fiscal situation is pretty dire. Uh, there's only four states out there that actually have a balanced budget at this point. Uh, they've been having budget cuts, hiring freezes, furloughs, their workforces are retiring. There's really not enough people and expertise out there to do this work. So a lot of states are turning toward uh, contractors, consultants to do this, but you really still need people on the ground to make the decisions and, and to make things happen. Um, and now, of course, with the election, there's a lot of turnover in the state leadership. There's 26 new gubernatorial administrations. Um, that means new health secretaries, for the most part, new Medicaid directors, new health policy advisors, a whole sort of turnover, a steep learning curve, um, and, and just sort of a whole turnover in, in policy perspectives. Uh, but the stakes are really high. Uh, ACA implementation really uh, relies on the states to be able to do a lot of it. Um, this is just a sort of a, 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 com a compilation of what we see are some uh, key advantages for states doing, uh, uh, doing the reform implementation. I won't go through each one, but, but uh, you can see them. And, and I think actually my slides are in handouts in your binder as well. Um, so what are the few things that states will need to do or are in the process of doing? One is that they need to develop strategic plans for implementing health reform and to coordinate all this implementation across state agencies. States, as you may know, have silos in them. There's the insurance silo, there's the Medicaid silo, there's the public health silo. Um, so there's a lot of what the work that's required under ACA it requires a lot of cross uh, agency coordination to make it really come together and really for states to take advantage of the opportunities in the ACA. Uh, so many are in the midst of this right now. Uh, a lot of them have executive orders that created um, coordinating councils or work groups, uh, task forces, those, uh, those sorts of things. Some states have legislative charges uh, that, that, that created those sorts of things. Some are just doing it because the governor said, you all get together and, and, and work on this. Uh, they have to implement, they, they actually have already implemented the high risk 
pool programs, or, or as the, the new name is, the Pre-Existing Condition Insurance Plans, PCIP. So that's a new ac acronym. You've got to get to know that one. Um, they're working on exchanges. Again, I'll get into the, the detail of that, but a lot of that, you know, developing partnerships, the whole IT system is causing heartburn out there in every single state that I know. Uh, they need to streamline enrollment and eligibility processes. Uh, the whole mar outreach and marketing, which is not something that uh, states have typically done, is really uh, coming to the forefront for exchanges as well. There's new insurance market provisions, some that are already in place, some that go into place in 2014. Um, they're exploring the whole sort of delivery and payment system uh, reform opportunities. Secretary Sebelius mentioned this in her remarks, um, that this whole issue of sustainability is, is critical in terms of uh, health reform. And then the states are trying to do something that they really haven't done in the past very well either, and that's trying to establish performance metrics and evaluations and milestones and sort of how do you, how do you make sure things are happening the way they should be. Uh, here's a list of some of the current insurance market provisions. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into some, uh, more detail here uh, from the state's perspectives, the three big areas, uh, early, the early insurance market reforms themselves uh, that, that, uh, that states need to enforce at this point. There's premium rate review. There were grants coming from the federal government. This is a list of the things that most of the states are using those grants to do. Um, and then there's the whole issue of the medical loss ratio. Yvette brought that up already, 80% of premiums um, have to be spent on medical costs in the small and individual group uh, markets and 85 in the large group markets. Um, there are a, a set of waivers that's being put in place as well with a few states asking for those waivers already. Um, and these are the other sort of state reform opportunities uh, and initiatives that states are, are looking at. The, uh, I mentioned the Medicaid expansion already, uh, but these sort of delivery system re redesign and, and is really, uh, states are focusing on, you know, how do you sustain coverage? I mean, coverage as, as co controversial and as difficult as that seems to be is actually the easy part. People really knew how to do that. I mean, some of the issues with setting up exchanges and, you know, the market, uh, market insurance market reforms, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with just money. It has to do with paying for the services and getting people into the coverage. Delivery system redesign, payment reform, that stuff is really hard. Most people don't know how to do it. It is taking um, money out of people's wallets and putting it into other people's uh, wallets or maybe hoping in to get it out of the whole system uh, altogether. Um, but, but in terms of sustainability, it is critical to improve quality and really contain the costs in the system. So these are a, a number of, of, of areas that states are working in to, to address uh, quality improvement, cost containment, uh, population health improvement, those sorts of things. Um, so with exchanges, um, it's really critical for states to be clear about their policy goals and their strategic objectives of their exchanges. Um, those, by, if they have those clear in their minds, that will really help guide what all their subsequent policy and operational decisions uh, will be. So I've listed here on a number of what, uh, what policy goals a state could have for their exchanges, um, but these are, you know, you can't really have all of these. There's tension between some of these. Um, so, so it's really important for, for states and for the stakeholders who are involved in these conversations to really understand uh, what the policy goals are. Um, so turning to, and, and this, is, this is usually the presentation I do, is, is this, this slide here is like an entire presentation. It's a, my, what I call the top 10 to-do list. Um, and, and the toolkit that, that NASI put out today is, is uh, incredibly uh, helpful in terms of, in regard to all these areas, so I, I would definitely recommend, I haven't read it in detail, but I was looking, you know, I was briefing, you know, briefly looking through it, and it, I saw that they really hit all the important aspects to it. So, you know, the first question that they're dealing with is, you know, should they set up an exchange or not? You know, is it a state-run exchange, or do you want the federal government to run the exchange? And there's lots of political issues for that, but there's even just, most of the time, most of the states, and, and Secretary Sebelius referred to this today, it's like even the states that are suing the federal government, they're moving forward with setting these exchanges up. They don't want the federal government, no, no offense, to, uh, to set them up for them. I mean, they just feel that they, they're more knowledgeable about their, their health care system, what their goals are on a state level. They know the stakeholders in the system, you know, so they, they just really feel that they're in a better place to do that. Now, 
there's other issues that come into play. Uh, I've had conversations with some very small western states. It's like, well, do we even have a big enough population to support an exchange? Can we get, you know, can we, can we, you know, if, if you have an exchange, if you have an outside market, you have an exchange market, you know, you're uninsured, is really small anyways, you know, can it, can it's really, is it really sustainable just in terms of operational, uh, operationally? So that's sort of a question, the first, it's almost the, 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 the first order question that states are dealing with. Um, they're all working to set up, the, the next question I guess I should say is uh, uh, how to set up a decision making process. Um, is this, some are trying to do this through legislation and uh, the, the model legislation that NAAC has come out with and that, that the, the NASI expert uh, panel has put together to sort of round that out. Um, it will be very helpful during this legislative session, but there I've been talking to a number of states that's saying, oh, we're not ready for that. You know, we've got new, a new governor, we've got new legislators. You know, we're, we, we don't want to bring this to our legislature this, this session. We want to wait a little bit. So, but that doesn't mean they still can't move forward. They can't create sort of a whole decision-making process, even though it might not be an exchange board or an exchange, um, you know, something that's created legislatively. Um, the next issue, governance and administration. Where, where do you want to set this up? Um, within state government, a nonprofit, what's the board structure look like, conflict of interest issues, all those sorts of issues that are related. And there's actually a, a NASA issue brief that came out accompanying the, the toolkit today as well. Eligibility and enrollment systems. This is causing the most angst, really huge. How, how do we take our legacy systems? How do we integrate um, the Medicaid eligibility and enrollment system with this new exchange and uh, eligibility and enrollment system. How, do, how is that all going to work? Um, critical. What role would the exchange play in the market? Are they going to be just a market organizer, just sort of put up on a website, here's all your choices? Or are they going to do more sort of selective contracting and really sort of put more pressure on what the requirements are for, for the carriers to be able to participate? Website and transparency, that's part of that's a requirement under the ACA. How do you set that all up? There's a lot of operational issues to that. Financing and budget, all the issues that are related to procurement, um, contracting, the IT, the outreach, all those issues. What would be the role of brokers and navigators as well? How do, how do these other um, plans fit in? The basic health plan, which is uh, allowed under the ACA. Um, how, how do you get the Medicaid exchange plan interaction, sort of when you hit that churn mark at 133%, where people are going back and forth between Medicaid and the exchange, and the whole issue of communications and public education. Here, a few challenges. The budget constraints, obviously, is, is huge. Uh, the second bullet, standardizing, I mentioned this already, standardizing and modifying the eligibility and enrollment processes. That is what states are truly focusing on right now. This is a huge issue. Um, developing the appropriate data and, and systems to, to monitor implementation. Again, that evaluation thing. How, how, how is my re insurance market reacting? Um, how well is the exchange functioning? Um, is quality improving? Is our costs moderating? Some lessons. Um, uh, these, this is from a previous, pre, some previous reform, state reform work that we've done. Um, really, it's important to, to simplify in, in eligibility and enrollment. The knowledge of commercial market issues is critical. The sufficient time to implement, again, there's that tension that's set up with, with the requirements under the federal reform versus, you know, really making it happen on the ground. Uh, state variation, uh, we spoke a little bit about that on our conference call. There's a whole, you know, whole list of, of areas where states vary, the politics and political culture, of course, the resources they have, um, the different levels of uninsured. Texas got 26 percent uninsured, Massachusetts has 2 percent uninsured. That has a huge impact on what states can do. Uh, their public programs look different, their insurance markets look different, their employer markets look different, their stakeholder involvement is different, um, and then their infrastructure. I mean, if you, if you expect a lot of this work to be done over the internet, the broadband, what's your broadband look like? You go to some of these states and, you know, out in the rural areas there is no broadband capacity out there, so you can't expect to have application um, processes that are done through the web. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I mentioned this before, really determining uh, and be, being clear about the policy goals and strategic objectives, it's a critical aspect to, to guide the subsequent divisions. 
I think states are really struggling with finding this balance between sort of the market competition and sort of using their regulatory, their regulatory power. Everybody sets up sort of the Utah, the Utah exchange as the, the, the market competition one and the, and the Massachusetts one is the regulatory one, but it's, it's really not quite so, so black and white. There's really a lot of space in between, um, and I would say that Massachusetts wants market competition as much as Utah was. Uh, does and, and Utah is using some of their regulatory authority to do some of the things that they need to do. Um, exchanges are new institutions. Um, a, a lot, some people think that they are going to try to address all problems and they will probably fail if they try to do that. Uh, others may be too timid and then it won't change much at all. So states are really trying to find that middle ground of, of making this all work. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm always happy to do anything Pam Larson asked me to do. She does a terrific job for all of you and um, is uh, a powerhouse in Washington and will be very necessary as we think about entitlements and all the other issues that I know are on your agenda. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't know how, how often all of you or each of you gets an opportunity to interact with uh, representatives from health insurance plans. So I thought I'd say a little bit about the market to begin. Secondly, talk about um, how we're working. And then third, talk about what we're working on. Just to size implementation and to give you a window into what it's like, uh, as Larry said, on the ground. And then I, look, I too look forward to uh, your questions. First, in terms of the market, just to size uh, the discussion for everyone. Most of the discussion about health care reform has been about the individual market. Roughly 18 million people are in the individual market. There are about 50 million people in the small group market, 160 in the large group market. That's the health insurance market. And then we also provide um, significant services to states in the context of Medicaid, running uh, Medicaid insurance plans, um, and that's growing because states are looking to our plans for the tools and techniques to reduce costs and improve quality, and indeed that has been our legacy. Uh, also, uh, we do Medicare Advantage, where um, almost 20% uh, of individuals in the Medicare program are in the Medicare Advantage program, where we can see uh, looking at government data, that our plans are doing a far better job than anything done in fee-for-service with readmissions, which is one of the number one challenges. The reason for that is we coordinate care. We do disease management. We've pioneered that. That's what our members do. We've brought pay for performance to the delivery system. No other entities have. We can measure data. We can give information to providers, and we can move the market in terms of actually teeing up what needs to be done with respect to health care costs. We coordinate care. We believe in the disease management and the case management we need to get to because unless we reframe, as Don Berwick has said, the way we pay for and deliver health care, we're not going to be able to get health care costs under control. So we have to both improve quality and um, reduce costs, which seem to be significant challenges in our delivery system, and I want to come back and say something about that at the end. So that's sort of the market. That's what we bring to the market and how we work. For all of our members, large, small, for-profit, not-for-profit, regional, local, national, what they all have in common is in each and every one of those cases, they have set up special units to implement health care reform, dedicated resources with respect to lawyers, um, actuaries, operations, medical directors, nurses, leaders in the quality uh, performance arena, all working together to do two things, to minimize costs for our commercial uh, payers and also for our government partners and to minimize disruption. That's what all of our members are doing and that's how they're doing it. Our job at AHIP has been to work steadfastly to organize our members so that we can get a sense of what their issues are, so we can capture it for um, individuals who are uh, at HHS implementing these programs, bringing them data, uh, being a trusted source for information, bringing them recommendations, and trying to make sure we're working hand in hand with our members to capture what's going on on the ground. So that's sort of the how 
uh, we're working. In terms of what we're working on, after the passage of the legislation, as um, Yvette and Enrique have talked about, uh, quite a significant amount of things have changed. Now, I'm sure all of you are thinking and have been thinking for some time, well, it's about time that we don't have pre-existing condition limitations. Let me just step back and give you just some subtext about that. We entered the healthcare reform discussion committed completely to the concept of market reforms. No other entity in the stakeholder community offered legislators changes in their sector, nor do they now. And this is the problem. We're committed to market reforms. We have been committed to market reforms. We made two points in the context of the legislation which relate to the discussion today. One, for that to work, we have to have everybody in. Clearly it doesn't. The states, Massachusetts was a great example first time around, they passed market reforms before they passed their mandate, the system virtually blew up, which is why they have a mandate in Massachusetts. Other states, I can name Kentucky, I can name Washington, a number of other states, without having everybody in, the market reforms don't work. So we made the point that you have to have everybody in, and we can deliver the market reforms. So I want everybody in this audience to know that it's not like our plans get up in the morning and say, let's compete to do pre-existing condition limitations. The only reason those strategies are in the market today is because health insurance in the individual market is a voluntary market. It works just like life insurance. It works just like auto insurance. It's 18 million people. Anybody in the small group market, anyone in the large group market, none of those issues apply. None. So that's why we were so steadfastly working to make sure people understood the record and the track record at the state level. We worked very, very hard to advance those issues. We became very concerned about the fact that healthcare cost containment didn't become the focal point that we sh thought it should be in the context of the discussion, and we have to come back to it given what we're seeing at the ground level, and I'll come back to that. But in terms of what we've been working on now, we've been working to uh, be very, very focused on what our plans are seeing in terms of implementing the provisions, where we can make suggestions to actually um, improve the implementation, and the administration has been very thoughtful about listening to those suggestions and we very much appreciate it. Our job is to make sure that implementation, because we will be judged by how implementation goes in our industry, works effectively. At the same time, I want to highlight a couple of points. MLR. Everyone in the policy community loves to talk about the Medicare um, MLR, the medical loss ratio. And as you know, that's a cap on administrative cost and profits. I know everyone feels relieved that we've done MLR. At the same time, just think about two points. Health insurance plans are 4% of total health care expenditures. So yes, we've done MLRs. We've capped administrative costs and profits. Profits are less than one penny of every health care dollar. So now the question is, what are we going to do about the under, other 99 cents? And what are we going to do about the costs that continue to, I'm using this word very carefully, explode at the, bot, at the, at the ground level? Outpatient costs are soaring, and this is the point we made to Congress because we see the bills before any uh, individual at HHS or in consulting firms actually see the results of what's going on at the ground. We can see things exploding, so outpatient costs continue to soar. They began to soar during the health reform discussion. Specialty drugs continue to soar. Monopolies, it's hard to negotiate with monopolies. Those costs continue to go up very significantly. Then we have um, the consolidated hospitals that continue to say 20%, take it or leave it, and that's an annual number. And it's happening all over the country. And then we have costs that are being pushed down because as the states wrestle with Medicaid, particularly, but also what's coming from Medicare, and it will be more exacerbated as we get to more of the compression under Medicare, there is a cost-shifting phenomenon. You don't have to take my word for it. You can talk to any employer, and they will validate that. In Northern California, there, that we are paying more than 200% of Medicare, highly consolidated hospital systems. So when we talk about MLR, the policy community as a whole has breathed a sigh of relief this is a marvelous advance, but in reality, it hasn't done anything to bring underlying costs under control. So as a society, we have a choice to make. 
we can continue as a policy community to basically everyone beat their chests and haven't we done a wonderful thing by creating MLR and bringing premiums under control. Make no mistake about it, there's no way to bring premiums under control unless we get underlying costs out, out of control, <coughs> under, uh, in control. Now, no member of Congress is going to win re-election by going home and telling their hospitals, we've got a wonderful idea about our idea last year was taking a point, a point and a half off future health care growth and having every stakeholder participate in that conversation and do something about it. Well, that didn't go very well because none of the other stakeholders necessarily are right now interested in taking down health care costs. But if we're going to save the economy and do the things that the president in such an inspirational way the other night talked about, investment in infrastructure, investment in education, we, got, we have to stop health care costs crowding out those investments. So we want to work very carefully, and again, to um, the President's and Don Berwick's uh, leadership credit, Nancy Ann and others, what has been done, as Yvette said, first out, for medical homes, the initiative on the public sector side is to actually combine with what the private sector has already begun. That's terrific, and we're going to see real results. There are going to be, I think, future initiatives that are going to be announced where the public sector and the private sector can work together to deal with quality. We're strongly supportive of that. That's exactly what needs to be done. But we have to move the mark on health care costs, and it has to be a discussion that goes beyond the health insurance community. Um, what's pending this year, ACO regulation, we're very strongly supportive of uh, the concept of accountable health care. We've pioneered those techniques and tools, and we bring them to the delivery system. But if in the end, if ACOs are a recipe for more consolidation, which increase costs, that will be a step back, not a step forward. I think the administration is working very, very carefully through those issues. We applaud them for that. We appreciate that because it's going to be very important to go forward and not go backward. Also, if we actually come out with a policy with respect to ACOs that increases cost shifting because of compression on the Medicare side so the bloom gets bigger, that also will be a step back, not a step forward. So we have to have a, lar a lar larger and a broader view of ACOs. Exchanges, we're working hand in hand with the states. We appreciate the fact that the, um, one of the, the immediate material out of the administration has, to be, has signaled that the states should take a leadership role and create the uh, structures that are right for their situation. We agree with that. We hope, and we're going to be working very hard, to make sure that exchanges just don't repeat everything that we have already in the states by way of regulatory authority, but actually focus on this competition. And, and choice. And what's really exciting, if you look at hhs.gov and you go in, I don't know how many people have had a chance to do it, you can put in your zip code and say whether you want HMOs or PPOs or what have you, it's really exciting to see how much choice there is in the market today. And so that's the kind of structure that we want to build on and create and we're going to work with both the administration and the states to continue to do that. So looking ahead to health reform, um, we are fully committed to getting health care coverage to all Americans. We never wavered from that committed, commitment. We're fully committed to market reforms. But we, are continue to be, we continue to be concerned about the issue of bringing costs under control because we recognize how difficult it is, how hard it is politically. There no, seems to be no reward politically for actually doing what's necessary. It's similar to an entitlement discussion. It needs to, we need to um, but give voice to the, ch the uh, options, give voice to the uh, ways uh, that can go forward in terms of resolving issues, but without a doubt, it's very hard. As we also look forward to 2014, we think there are things that can be looked at that will inadvertently increase costs and will, I think no one would want that to happen. We think the health care sales tax, premium tax, will increase costs, not decrease costs. 
on, it's imposed on the very people, individuals and small business that we want to keep in the system. So we think that moves in the wrong direction and we're offering suggestions about how to deal with that. And then finally for a group of people who are so focused on intergenerational issues, just one matter which is very challenging to deal with because it really depends on where you are in the age spectrum and you'll understand this immediately. Right now health plans in the individual market, only in the individual market, they charge uh, folks who are at the higher end of the age spectrum versus the lower a ratio. And in most states, the ratio is anywhere from 5 to 7 to 1 on average. Now, if you're at the higher end of the age distribution, you say, that is terrible, we've got to bring it down. No question. If you're at the younger age stage of the age distribution, you're saying, well, that makes a great deal of sense because I want to pay according to my risk, just like life insurance and auto insurance. The legislation takes 5 to 7 down to 3 overnight. So anyone on, under 40 is going to feel a direct impact of that. So those are the kinds of things that we're working on in a productive way to try to signal that there are things that inadvertently increase costs, don't decrease costs. There are things that could be strengthened that decrease costs. And there are tools and techniques that we can continue to bring to the delivery system to work collaboratively with the public sector to move the mark and to get much more effective reduction in costs, which every one of us as Americans wants to see. So I hope that gives you a window into how we're working, what we're working on, and what we're going to hopefully uh, work on with a variety of stakeholders, with the administration, with uh, members of Congress uh, as we go forward. Thank you very much. Okay, now the fun begins. We've got two mics here. We've got mics walking around. If you need a mic to come to you, raise your hand. I'm going to uh, lob out a few questions to get things going, but I, uh, we've got a lot of time here, and we've got an incredible panel. Um, so I'm going to start off, uh, I've got a question for the whole panel, but I want to start off um, first, Karen, with you. Um, you're one of the uh, key players in health reform debates and health policy for a long time, and, and someone who's widely respected. And yet we've come out of a period during the debate of health reform in which your organization, uh, particularly in the fall of 2000, um, uh, the fall of 2009, came out very publicly, uh, well, I guess really the fall of, yeah, 09, uh, came out pretty publicly opposed to the reform, uh, contributed substantially to Republican candidates who were elected, who are now in office talking about repeal. So that's one side of the ledger. On the other side, you're very persuasive about the degree to which uh, you and your organization and your members are committed to implementing a reform. So it's like doc Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at the same moment. Could you help just square those? I mean, maybe I'm, I've got it wrong, but could you square those two sides of, of um, the role that you play and that your organization plays? When, um, I'll start with the last part of the question first. Once legislation is passed, then um, no matter what view an entity or organization had about whether or not uh, it will fulfill its objectives, the responsibility of a large constituency is to make sure that um, you are productively engaged in implementation. No question about that. And that's what we've been focused on. Um, our members are going to be judged about how they implement the legislation, and they are seriously focusing on everything that's necessary to be done in the way that people expect it to be done. So we're fo that's our job one. In terms of the legislation, in terms of the um, study that you're referring to, um, we uh, raised issues about the, at that point, there was, there was no, premium, uh, no penalty attached to the mandate, and we, we said that we didn't think that would work and what the, the economic implications of that. $95 as a penalty is still really um, a challenge in terms of getting those people into the system. We talked about that intergenerational issue I talked about. That's going to be a very big problem in the areas. Uh, California has always over 20 percent of people who are uninsured. When they did their legislation, they maintained a 5 to 1 ratio because bringing it down to 3 to 1 um, or even 4 to 1 wouldn't have uh, gotten the people into the system that needed to be there. So I think that's maintained, that still is an issue. We talked about the health tax. 
which without a doubt is going to increase costs. Um, we were concerned about that and we talked about cost shifting, which um, is um, a very significant concern on the part of purchasers. So time will tell about what exactly happens, but um, in terms of our focus, now we're no longer in a legislative arena. We are in an implementation world, and our focus is on uh, the affordability issue, the disruption issue, and there are no better people than our members who have a bird's eye view of what can be done to achieve those two objectives to identify the specifics that are necessary to actually accomplish that. So that, I hope, explains where we are, why we're where we are, and the fact that um, we're very, very focused on now what we see are also additional cost containment opportunities that we hope not to leave on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Yeah, I want to get to that, uh, and I want to thank you for that answer. It's sure. helpful. And as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not supporting the repeal effort in Congress. Our, mem our CEOs, I'll let them, um, their quotes stand for themselves. Uh, we've been very clear that our focus has been at the time, whether it's 09 or 10, or 11. It continues to be on those provisions that we were concerned about. We're nothing if not consistent in terms of concerns. Uh, no one's surprised about that. They've heard us talk about those issues I mentioned, and we're going to continue to talk about them. At the same time, we have a great deal uh, to offer by way of technical information in terms of how to make provisions work. Okay. Um, and I, I have to say, as an admirer of, of your effectiveness, I, I found it fascinating and, and important to note that during the debate uh, that the, um, your association was one of the groups, particularly with regard to the, uh, the individual mandate, mm -hmm. that was talking very clearly about mm -hmm. we need to have an individual exactly. mandate and the penalty needs to be higher and the timing of your, of your pullout of, of, of kind of working and, and at least tacitly supporting the effort was when it got too weak. And you've made this point, but yes. I think it sometimes gets lost in the debate where there's a conflation yeah. of some of the people who are critics of the reform, some of whom just don't believe in government, and others who see that if this is going to work, you are going to need some government role so that you, you genuinely have Yeah, we our, our view is um, our role is to help government achieve its objectives in the best possible way. Okay. Um, and when we're partners, we're partners in Medicaid, we're partners in Medicare, and we're partners in a variety of endeavors. And uh, again, the tools and techniques we have are the real values that people are talking about in terms of achieving accountability. Great. I want to thank you very much. Uh, I want to put one other question. We've got people uh, who want to line up. And this is really for the panel as a whole. Um, and if that, maybe I could start with you. When I go around talking to people, I say, well, here's what's envisioned in terms of the reform. The one thing everyone starts with is cost control. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, the, the question comes in a lot of forms, but it's basically, we're spending $1 trillion. And, it, and, that, and, that, and that statement in and of itself is meant to be kind of the conclusion. Mm -hmm. How is it that we can spend a $1 trillion and really believe the CBO uh, estimates of deficit reduction? Well, uh, I mean, I would just start by saying that the, the president's focus in the bill um, was to bend the cost curve. And he talked about it consistently. Um, we expanded coverage. We improved quality. But there was a focus on both in Congress and in the White House that actually bending the cost curve. And, you know, according not just to the Congressional Budget Office, but to hundreds of economists, we were successful in the law at doing that. Now, that being said, we are happy, um, as he has indicated, to look at any additional proposals that um, people like Karen, who have the expertise, people in the states, um, consumers, providers believe will help us to further bend the cost curve. Uh, we are happy to look at any of those proposals, and we are fully focused on reducing costs in health care. And that there are a number of provisions in the bill that actually um, we believe successfully do that. Thank you. Uh, Enrique, I want to turn to you on this issue of cost control. I spent a lot of time with state people, uh, Minnesota and other states. Just had Scott Pattison out, who's the director of the, NAS, the, the state budget officers. And the universal view, as far as I can tell, at the state level is this is a runaway train. It's going to explode costs on Medicaid and perhaps other areas. The, the payers and the employers are very concerned about it. What do you see in terms of states, in terms of how they're thinking about cost control and what strikes you as some of the most effective strategies being designed? 
Um, sure. Uh, I, I mean, it was a runaway train before there was reform. So, I mean, don't, don't conflate reform with runaway costs. I mean, uh, the, the, it's important to, to, to know that, yes, there will be costs to the Medicaid program as it expands, but I mean, it, the, the federal government's going to cover 100% of those costs for several years, and then it only goes down to 90. That's, that's more than the current federal match, which is about 50% in most states. I mean, that is, that is the deal of the century for states. I mean, they should not be walking away from that. That's an incredible amount of money that's coming. It's almost like stimulus number three coming into the states. Um, it's an economic development driver, in fact, if, if anything. Um, but that being said, of course, you know, state fiscal situations are, are dire, um, you know, not only in, their, in the public sector, in the private sector, they're, you know, they've been dealing with, with the same, you know, the same trajectory that, that you see everywhere in terms of, of health insurance costs. So the states that we've been working with, you know, it's, as I mentioned before, I mean, this is, this is the hard part. This is how do you, how do you drive costs out of the system? And, and somebody's, you know, cost for somebody is somebody else's income. That's one thing to remember. Um, the other thing that is driving the costs is people's behavior, um, obesity, smoking, um, those sorts of things. So you have to deal with, with that, pub, you know, it's public health. The, the thing that I've been seeing over the past few years, which is very interesting, and actually Minnesota is one of the leading states with this, and it gets back to that silos, is, is trying, to, trying to meld sort of reform efforts with public health efforts. Before, I, I literally had been in states three years ago where the public health um, officer is saying, why should I care about health care reform? Um, and now it's like, oh, of course, I, of course, you know, the reform people, the Medicaid people are saying, oh, we got to talk to our, our public health folks. That's a critical aspect. And the public health people are saying, oh, we got to, we got to be talking with these other folks because we can contribute and we can really help sort of get to these underlying cost drivers. So that's one thing is sort of uh, the public health, population health aspect. The other thing that's been mentioned, the whole medical homes, um, more prevention, chronic care management, um, supporting that sort of thing, the inf information technology structures. Vermont is a, is a great um, example with their blueprint for health up there. They, they're just phenomenal in the work that they're doing. A lot of states are interested in how to do that. It's a very local initiative, but it's very scalable. It's very, uh, you can, you can put, put that out to many other states. Uh, the whole issue of comparative effectiveness, you know, what are the things that are working? One of the, you know, you, you've heard, I think Yvette said, you know, 30% of what's being delivered now is not effective. Um, that's just an astronomical amount of money that could be coming out of the system or being redirected in the system. Um, one of the hard things I think that states are, are dealing with, and, and Karen mentioned it, is, is, the, is the whole sort of monopolistic aspect to the provider side of things. And, and ACOs, that's a big question. It's like, is that going to really lead to cost containment, cost savings with, with coordinated care, or is that going to just create these monoliths of providers that are going to have even more leverage against the, uh, uh, you know, when, when it comes to negotiating with, 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 uh, with carriers. And then I guess the last thing, and again, Minnesota is a, a leadership, is taking leadership there, is the whole issue of transparency and really, you know, quality measures, cost measures, the, 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 the balance of cost and quality, value, the value measures, and how do, you, how do you get people to react to that? Is that just putting data up, or do you build that into benefit design? Do you build that into provider tiering strategies, things like that, cost, the cost, um, you know, cost arrangements, deductibles and co-pays to get people to sort of change their behavior in terms of of using, using more effective services. Great, thank you very much. Karen, there have been a number of points that overlap with what you've already said. Is there more you want to add? Well, I, I actually am beginning issue? to think that um, we have probably made a mistake in the policy community on cost containment. And in the context of the ACA, the discussion to the extent um, there was the, a focus on cost containment, it was more kind of national 50,000 foot. And, Enrique just reminded me that I'm beginning to think that there might be a way to, we haven't talked about this much, but to really give states incentives for different stakeholders to work together. And you could think about to the extent that you see real progress, there could be shared savings. Um, I don't think there's much in the way of Medicaid because that's so compressed right now. Um, but I think you could look broadly at federal accounts Medicare, um, tax expenditures, um, 
subsidies, and to the extent costs that are projected don't actually materialize, um, there is a real, I think, opportunity there in terms of states and rewarding them. It's a little bit of an inchoate idea, but um, you just reminded me in your comments that maybe we've been going about this the wrong way. Maybe what we want to do is tangibly incent providers and uh, health plans and physicians and consumers and employers at the state and state officials at that level, because it's closer to the ground, taking this whole exchange concept and really thinking about, is there a strategy that could be fashioned there? Is that easier than doing it as a whole at the national level? So again, um, rather just a preliminary thought, but I, I think we probably as a country need to begin thinking about more of that. Might be easier to pull off. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Ellen Bruce. I'm um, with OWL, the voice of midlife and older women. I'm also at UMass Boston. And I, I have one comment and then my question. Um, I can't resist um, just pointing out that actually OWL um, opposed any age rating um, that for us we felt that the um, one to three differential was discriminatory on age and that when, especially when you look at um, eliminating pre-existing conditions, which is a much better indicator of whether or not you're going to need the health insurance than the age, um, that really the age rating, all it does is ask healthy older people to support unhealthy older people and younger the same way. You're basically just asking, you know, dividing people by age for the subsidy. Um, so that, that's my comment. I just put it out there. Uh, wasn't what I came up to say, but I couldn't resist. Uh, just for the where you stand, of course, depends on where you sit. We get that. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, and no so, one's wrong in all of this. It's just a question of how you get the younger healthier folks to participate, that's all this, and, and there's really, there's intergenerational conflict without a doubt. And no one's right, no one's wrong, just it's a question of how do we knit it together in a way overnight mm -hmm. that won't drive people from the system. So we made one step going that way, I would, not to belabor the point, but we certainly would oppose going the opposite direction. Um, through through other ways. But that, that's, as I said, that wasn't my question when I came. I actually did have a question, um, which is, um, being from Massachusetts, one of the things that um, I um, watched was that in trying to implement um, health care reform, what there was was a, um, although different opinions among different, you know, providers, advocates, insurers, what there was was a really, um, goodwill among everyone to make that, to make it work, to make it happen. And my question is sort of looking out across the states now, um, how much of that goodwill do you see and how much is there um, a tension that may undercut the implementation? Um, Yeah, well, everybody. I can start. I, can start. Um, I, I, I think you're right. There, there. Massachusetts came at it in a different place, a different way. Um, you know, the People's Republic of Massachusetts. We're all in it together, um, and I think that and one of the lessons for that is. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm teasing, but um, there, there was a so, there's a social consciousness in Massachusetts. I think mm -hmm. after for long periods of time of trying to do health reform for 20, 30 years, exactly. having successes, having you know. F push back and, 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 and I think it was, there were, you know, there were a lot of people who were, who were in favor of making this work. Um, and I think that that is absolutely true in not, there are many states where that holds for the federal reform. There are other states that it does not hold. Um, some of that is political rhetoric. Um, some of that is, um, some of that is, is a reality on the ground in terms of the stakeholders. Um, but the work that I'm seeing, and, and again, Secretary Sebelius sort of mentioned this in her remarks, it's like even, the, even those states that are moving ahead with, with a, you know, in, in the, the federal lawsuit, they're all, they're all doing all these things that I listed out. They're all creating, for, you know, uh, not all, but I would say 
48 out of the 50 states, um, you know, have task forces, work groups, they're all trying to figure out how do we make this work? How can we take advantage of what the opportunities are in the federal bill to meet our policy goals? It goes back to those policy goals. Um, there's enough flexibility in federal reform to allow exchanges to do, to, to just almost be sort of the, you know, travelocity of health insurance versus, you know, Massachusetts being much more sort of selective in terms of their contracting or, or having a high bar in terms of who's going to participate. Um, but there, there are real tensions out there. Uh, you know, when, once, when a lot of these uh, governors were elected that were uh, in their campaigns were against the, the, uh, the ACA and the federal reform, and I had calls from reporters, they said, well, what's going to happen now in those states? And it was like, well, there's a, there's a difference between campaigning and governing, and so it's really going to see how this plays out on the ground. Um, so, so that may be that may be part of an answer. Uh, one thing that that also brought back to is is the individual mandate and how um, I know that the federal reform in the, uh, the the level of it, which is obviously a concern, the the, the penalty. Um, really, they modeled that on Massachusetts's level, and I think that gets back to Massachusetts really sort of felt that there was more of a social compact in that state than necessarily there are in other states. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I'm, wor I'm, wor I'm worried about that in, in terms of the level of the, of the, of the penalty yeah. and bringing in the, the healthy people. Karen? Well, I'm from Rhode Island, so I always like people from Massachusetts. Do you want the politically correct answer or do you want the other answer? We want the other answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, because it's Friday, I guess um, it, you don't have to necessarily be politically correct on the eve of the weekend. Um, I think that it would bear um, thinking about, and I wouldn't have the temerity to know exactly because I'm not up in the state the way you are, but um, now that we're talking about the tough issue of health care cost containment in Massachusetts, the climate's different, the rhetoric's different, it's harder, no question. So you're right, when we're talking about access alone, it, the, um, the rhetoric was slightly different than it is now. And I think this current um, uh, representation indicates just how difficult it is to really get at these tough, both political as well as economic issues. Now, I'm uh, confident that um, there's going to be a great deal of leadership from a whole range of s sectors up there, but I think we're not there yet. And I do think the rhetorical temperature is very different than it was a few years ago when it was just the access issue. Yvette, I'm wondering if I could just tweak this and pick up what Karen said, which is um, uh, how do you see the lesson of Massachusetts moving forward, particularly given Karen's point about the shift from the kind of hallelujah moment of putting it in place to the kind of, uh, you know, World War I trench warfare of cost control? Right. Well, I actually do think that we um, learned the lessons before we enacted the law because we did see the necessity of the individual responsibility requirement because the market reforms don't work without it. We did see that the lack of um, cost control mechanisms in Massachusetts was going to become a problem and that's why we incorporated so many into the law. And I also think, you know, we, what we learned from Massachusetts is that it can be done, that an exchange can be used to organize the individual market and the small group market in a way that makes it accessible, affordable, and comprehensible to people, which is not how it currently exists. So, and then at the same time, what we've, what we've, um, what we learned from Massachusetts in their effort to set it up, you know, as they partnered with the Boston Red Sox to market it, which is not going to work in New York, um, <laughs> is that you, that is why it is a state-based model, and this law relies so heavily on the states to implement. Um, you know, obviously, states that are unwilling or unable, um, the federal government will come in and contract to run an, an exchange in the state, but we generally want the states to do it. We believe they know their populations better, they know their providers, they know what will work, will not work in terms of marketing. Um, and that's, that's part of this, is that states will be able to figure out what works best for them um, and with the support from the federal government to actually get it done. So the collegiality, I think, grows 
as the indications become more and more real that states are going to do this and we we have every indication that all the states are going to do this so I think they will they will find their own way to get it done and that was the point of this being state-based thank you thank you very much for your patience your hello my name is Danny Perry I'm with the Alliance for retired Americans and Karen this is just a quick two-part question for you I believe you had said in your opening remarks that Medicare Advantage which of course is a privately run Medicare program has done a much better job at controlling hospital readmission rates yes. so I'm wondering if you can just share a little bit more um, about why you think that is what what they're doing differently than traditional Medicare. And I'm just wondering to get your, your thoughts, comments, what you've been hearing from your industry partners on the reduction of the Medicare Advantage overpayments. Um, one, in terms of the readmissions, um, we, and my colleague Jeff Lemieux, who runs our Policy and Research Center, has um, quite a number of studies um, documenting the answer to your question. So I'll just give you the cliff note version. Essentially, what we're doing is coordinating care. So the moment an individual leaves, designating an individual who will be responsible for providing support. What's, what is the situation in the home? Um, are they, is the patient going back to a home that, where um, changes are necessary? They have the care system necessary. They understand their orders. They understand their prescription drugs. Um, they uh, know when to get their follow-up care. They have their appointments made. These seem like simple things, but just having that kind of continuity of care, coordination, and doing it in a system, a systematized way, has really made a difference, which is very exciting because I've got a chance to meet the individuals who are responsible for the families, the care managers, and they feel very strongly about what they do. They're really proud of it, and it just gives me goosebumps to talk about because you can see tangibly what they're doing. In terms of um, the um, so-called overpayments, the MedPAC uh, number is 115% um, on average. That really um, doesn't uh, tell a story. Back in 2000, <clears throat> after the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, Democrats and Republicans united to put more money back into the program because in areas with low health care costs like Oregon, Washington, uh, New Mexico, um, Michigan, upstate New York, parts of Illinois and Ohio, where we were seeing that there were pullouts, people were losing their care systems on which they had relied, and doctors were beginning to really no longer participate in Medicare and were looking for um, the ability to do medical homes and the kind of supports I've just described. So um, it, what MedPAC has never really done is differentiated the congressionally mandated numbers and increases from 2000 with the non. And if you do that, you look in Oregon, it's about 130-something percent of Medicare. In Washington, it's slightly less than that. In upstate New York, there's nothing about this program we don't know. Upstate New York, it's in the 120s. So it, on 115 is an average, which doesn't show you exactly where the money was put. In Hawaii, it's 140 percent, where the money was put, why it was put there, and what's being done. So now the legislation is taking, with interactions, about $200 billion out of the program over 10 years. Without a doubt, according to Rick Foster, according to CBO, they seem to agree that that's going to reduce significantly both the numbers of players in terms of medical, Medicare Advantage. So we're going to have a repeat of <clears throat> what happened after 97 and the numbers of individuals who will be able to take advantage of these programs. So I think that is going in the wrong direction, not the right direction in terms of the kinds of um, quality. We're the only systems that actually measure quality and we have a, a track record. It's monitored and plans compete with plans. I think a better way to do this is to really look at outcomes and performance and create incentives that actually uh, require performance to be very transparent and um, it's a different uh, a way to approach. So it's a, the, what's happened is more of a MEDAX approach, which I think will have real uh, negative impacts in a com on a community by community basis on individuals who are very low income, uh, many who have health care disparities, 
who are counting on these systems to treat them and to um, make sure that they don't fall back in terms of what has been accomplished by their physicians um, and caregivers. So I, I think we have more conversation as a country about what's been done, uh, is it too much, and what are alternatives for actually um, being sensitive about the issue of participating in cost reduction, but at the same time not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, so if that uh, meets, meet acts, uh, baby out with the bathwater, uh, low income, vulnerable populations being uh, aggrieved, is that the way you see uh, the treatment of Medicare Advantage? No. Um, <laughs> I, I think, um, look, I mean, Karen's right. We, you know, we have to, as a country, evaluate um, how we view this policy and what the outcomes of it are. I will say that the issue was that for the small number of Medicare enrollees in Medicare Advantage, the number of enrollees outside of Medicare Advantage were subsidizing those premiums. And the costs in excess of 100% fee-for-service was costing the beneficiaries in, in fee-for-service additional dollars every month in premiums. Um, that, um, considering that everyone will have access to Medicare benefits always, no matter where you live, if you're in fee-for-service, that was simply inequitable for um, Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries to be subsidizing premiums for the small number of Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. Um, you know, when the program was put into place, it was put into place with the understanding that there could be cost savings so these plans would be paid in 97% of fee-for-service. So the, the sort of the expectations and the promises were not being met, and that's why Congress acted in the manner it did in the Affordable Care Act. So we'll see, um, you know, what the outcome of that is and what the real consequences are, not what not we, we hear. Um, and then to Karen's point, we'll all have to evaluate as a country, is that what we anticipated and how do we want to react? Thank you very much. I think that was very helpful. Next question. Yeah, Gail Hunt, National Alliance for Caregiving. I know Enrique and Karen just touched at a very, and I know this that was at the 40,000 foot level, touched on the issue of uh, patient engagement and uh, edu community education. And then just in the Q&A here, the issue of comparative effectiveness research. I think it's going to take an enormous amount of uh, education to bring patients up to the and families up to the level of sophistication that will bend the cost curve and the ex but the expectation is in the system that they will be able to you know look at the discuss with their doctor what these different options are and then pick the ones that are actually the best for them and the you know maybe help the system out a little bit too so i'd love for you guys to comment on that really critical issue of sort of patient education Do you want to go first? sure sure uh, no I, I agree it is a critical issue and 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 i only touched on it i mean the whole the whole idea of of consumer engagement that's sort of the rubric that that we talk about this is is actually multifaceted i mean it's 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 how do you engage them in 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 their own health wellness you know those sorts of things it's critical you know the prevention um, so, so those sort of making sure they stay healthy um, then sort of there's the next level as you were mentioning you know how do you provide them with good information to to make decisions about treatment options and that that's a huge um, area that states are actually trying to to work in as well. I know Washington State is creating these decision aids that they're you know trying to pilot out there. Um, it's going to take a lot of health information technology to do that. Health information exchange, medical records, polit you know personal health records. So there's a lot of sort of infra you know technology aspects to it. Um, there's uh, the the other aspect of consumer engagement is. Um, is also just being engaged with all the policy work that's being done. Actually, the ACA allows and requires, in fact, a lot of consumer input into all these design issues and these and these operational issues. So I think that's another important aspect in terms of not just the person taking you know responsibility for their health or you know trying to understand you know how what are the best treatment options.
options, but also to be more engaged in the policy issues as well. I mean, I guess there's sort of a place in between that I, that I left out, which is um, how do you, how can the system create, um, you know, I always, uh, before I came to Academy Health, I worked for, uh, for the state of Maryland, and, and I worked at the, the independent agency that created all of the performance guides for health plans and, and hospitals and nursing homes. Um, and we always had this discussion about, well, is just giving this information to consumers really going to do anything? Um, and we always thought, well, we hope so, but we always thought it was probably more for internal quality improvement in terms of who was being measured. Um, so, so, you know, it's not just giving consumers information and saying, here's, here's data, here's quality measures, go and make your decisions. Um, but also, it's really, how do you build it into benefit design? How do you build it into, um, he, Minnesota's doing this with their provider, it's called provider uh, peer, peer oh, no, I can't remember the word, peer, provider peer grouping. And basically, they're collecting measures of their providers, their hospitals, and they're, and they're trying to get down into the physician level of, you know, what are the best what are the best value, the, the highest quality for the lowest cost, creating these tiers and then setting, up, setting it up so either premiums differ, are, are different depending on what you choose or your co-pays are different, or maybe your deductible levels are different, but sort of building it in to help to drive sort of the consumer engagement into the right place. So there's a, a whole sort of multifactorial areas of consumer engagement. I think it's critical. It's, people have to become engaged. It's been so long that people are not engaged. They're sort of um, standing on the, on the, on the sidelines. And it's, and it's easy to stand on the sidelines of health care. It's very complicated. So any, any efforts to make it more, more easily and readily understandable for consumers is, is a good thing, in my opinion. Um, I think there are two buckets here. You talk about consumers and then the whole um, comparative effectiveness. In terms of the consumer, our plans are working very, very hard <clears throat> to structure what's called now value-based benefits. So we encourage consumers to participate in their care plans, participate in disease management programs. I have asthma. On a day like this, you can hear it. Um, <clears throat> and if I fill my medications, participate in my care plan, my plan now is um, incenting me to do that financially. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But the point is, with value-based benefits, you can't really do as much as you could do unless we know about value, which then comes to bucket number two, comparative effectiveness. With this explosion of information we've had, which is really exciting as patients, but from a physician perspective at the bedside, how does one drug compare to another? How does one drug compare to a device or a therapy? And right now, a physician has an arsenal of things he or she can do, but how do you know where is the value and how one compares to the other? That's the theory of comparative effectiveness. And from a patient perspective, none of us should expect any less. So I think Congress was right to create this idea of the best and the brightest coming together to have an impartial review of what the answer that is in value. And I think that, um, uh, and I'm hoping that that will be maintained. I know the pressure is coming to ditch that, but we're kidding ourselves if we ditch programs that allow us as consumers to have the kind of information and physicians that we need. And then you can incent the kinds of um, behavior. You can reward the kinds of compliance I talked about. We have um, health plans all around the country that are giving people lower co-pays and deductibles, things that make sense to them economically if they're participating in their care plan. And you're going to see much, much more of that. But you have to have the information. It's going to be the backbone of that to make sure that you're doing it right. And when we want third parties to make that decision. So we're very excited about the potential to sort through all this information. But you're right in asking the question, the two work hand in hand. This is one of the areas where ACA has helped to create a framework. Yes, exactly. For, for regulated uh, yeah. competitive markets. Where you, and this has been the dream back to Entoven mm -hmm. that we would have you know, right. consumers making these kind of value-based choices. But, but they need information. Exactly. And, the and truth third party is, information. Third party information that's trusted by yes, a trusted source. Exactly. And we've never really had that despite the dream. We've got two and a half minutes, so I'm going to just uh, invoke the, uh, the, the prerogative of recommending a lightning round of answers. Maybe we could take <laughs> two questions and then we'll allow that. our panelists <laughs> to have the last word. Does that Thank have you. To be yes or no? No, not yes or no, but. Uh, sure. but yeah. 
Hi, I'm Daniel Marins from Social Security Works. I guess my, my question is mainly directed at Karen, but I enjoy hearing from everybody. I think you've made a good case that um, the real drivers of health care costs do not come from the health insurance plans themselves, but from sort of these providers and, and, and the redundancies and inefficiencies there. I, I wonder if um, th th there is a question, though, about sort of uh, market share of, of certain health insurance plans in, in, in given states and, and the ability of employers and individuals to choose. And, I, and I, I wonder if the state health insurance exchanges will ease that at all. Oh, sorry. But I, I, I want, you know, I mean, because you, you did mention sort of the consolidation of monopolies on the provider end. And some people accuse the health insurance plans of the same thing. And whether or not a nonprofit or a public option would be a suitable remedy for that. OK, great. Thank you. Let's take one more question, and we'll let. Uh, thank you. 30, 30 seconds. As, <clears throat> as an analyst, I, I'm really just skeptical about keep hearing these numbers that you know 30% uh, of our care is unnecessary. I just think that should be debated some more. And then as a recent patient not in Medicare Advantage, uh, getting uh, some orthopedic surgery, two, two of them in the last 14 months, in, at the People's Republic of Massachusetts. It's a well-known hospital. I, I had all the, Karen, my name is David Potoff, by the way, at the University of North Carolina. Uh, I had all the coordinated care that you're talking about, and I was not in Medicare Advantage. I, I think you're making these too much of a, a yes-no thing. This is all being done. And then the final comment on that, while it was wonderful for all these occupational therapists, physical therapists, to come to my house, uh, some of it was actually redundant and all that. So I, I think we're, we're, we're oversimplifying some of these things in terms of the Medicare Advantage versus non, and also I think we have to be careful about where we're, we're doing these resources. It's a little bit more complicated than I think you've all of you made it, but you're a wonderful panel anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let, let me start with Yvette, and we'll just go straight down the panel. Yvette, do you want to answer? Um, Either of you, we've got one question <laughs> about health insurance exchanges, uh, private insurers, nonprofit, uh, and then the, the question about the, the, the contrast between Medicare Advantage and, and traditional Medicare. Well, I, you know, I would, I would just say that I'm, you know, I'm thrilled the healthcare system worked for you, regardless, you're right, regardless of whether you're Medicare Advantage or Medicare Fee for Service, it worked for you and that's what matters. Um, I think, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act, um, directly to the point, is about the people that it's not working for at all right now because they're not in the system and they can't get into the system. And almost as importantly, if not equally as importantly, the people that are in the system and are paying um, are soon going to be out of the system because they won't be able to afford the double digit increases that they're facing. So, I mean, you're exactly right. Whether it's nonprofit, for profit, Medicare Advantage, Medicare Fee for Service, we need the system to work for everybody. That's what the exchanges are about. That's why the tax credits are there and available. That's why we reformed the insurance marketplace. That's why the early deliverables in the bill were all about people who could not get coverage and now have that coverage. Um, and you know, we, we all have to evaluate in the coming years uh, how it's working and whether, you know, whether it needs to be tweaked and how, and we'll do that. Karen? Uh, two points. I think Yvette's right, um, the way she said, just said it. Um, we need the healthcare system to work for everyone. Uh, we agree with that. In terms of Medicare Advantage, the point I was making was about readmissions um, and the government data with respect to Medicare Advantage head-to-head -head with uh, fee-for-service. That, that was the research that I was talking about in terms of coordinated care in that context. Um, and with respect to competition, um, uh, often people point to Alabama and um, the share that the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan has in Alabama, uh, which is a very high share, and they have some of the lowest increases in the country in terms of uh, rates of increase. So um, you, um, I, I think that uh, in the policy community, it's, it's become too easy to talk about for-profit, not-for-profit, label one way or another. The proof should be in the pudding and the performance. And our plans are, that's why we're so excited about the concept of exchanges. We continue to strongly support it so plans can compete with plans and compete on their performance, on their outcomes, and demonstrate to consumers what they can do Thank and you. let consumers choose. Thank you very much. Enrique, uh -huh. quick final point. Okay. The competition issue with exchanges, uh, I think that's one of the, the great things about the ACA that actually leaves some flexibility up to the states to be able to figure out if there's uh, some sort of public option that they may want to try to uh, 
incorporate in that. I know uh, Connecticut, with their new Sustinet program, is trying to figure out if that's uh, something that they can uh, can do. Um, in terms of the Medicare Advantage, um, I, I guess I'd just sort of echo here. It's really the structure of it is not important. What's really important, well, it may be important, but what's really important is, is your care coordinated? I mean, there's plenty of managed care organizations out there who really don't do a very good job at coordinating your care in it, but there's other ones that do a great job. So, you know, that really is the, the core under, underlying thing. In terms of the 30% of care being unnecessary, that actually does come from a RAND Corporation um, study f uh, from several years ago that was, uh, the, and, and, the, the, and that's, that, that covers a wide variety of, of areas of what's unnecessary. So some it's overutilization, underutilization, misutilization, um, and the problem is, is it's so embedded that it's not like you can say, oh, there it is, let's just get rid of that. It's like, in, it's incorporated everywhere, and so that's what's hard to get it back out. Thank you very much. Uh, so take home points here. Point one, we're in a new age. This is no longer national health insurance or not. We're now into the new age of implementing what's been passed and then the, the trench warfare of a cost control. And I think Karen is absolutely right. For folks who think it's all about insurers being private insurers and, 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 and the operation of those markets, it's a whole lot more than that. And we're about to, to deal with that part. The other part is you wonder where the action is in health reform? Go to the states. And my prediction is uh, the next time we're dealing with health reform, it's picking out the next Massachusetts. Could be Utah, could be public option or regional public option in the Northwest, but that's what the game is going to be. And those of you interested in this, follow the states closely. NASI's put together a great uh, uh, resource for all of us uh, following this. Uh, please join me in thanking this terrific panel. And now I'd like to uh, invite up uh, my, my uh, co-chair, uh, Bill uh, Hoagland, I th oh good, Avis is here too, uh, for just a, a, a very few quick concluding comments. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your attendance uh, late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. It wasn't exactly clear to me with the weather outside we were going to have any participation. It made us all nervous, so thank you very much. We started with a snowstorm. We're finishing with a snowstorm. <laughs> Second, I cannot express uh, enough, uh, along with my fellow co-chairs here, Larry and Avis, our appreciation to the NASI staff in really honchoing this uh, conference. Uh, special thanks uh, particularly to Ben uh, Vehe and Elsa Walker, but all of Pam's staff, and to the extent they're still here, I'd like them to stand so that we can recognize them and thank them for all their hard work. <laughs> Keeping us on time. Finally, uh, some uh, quick takeaways, at least from my perspective, run through them real quick. Number one, Mr. Feinberg, master of disaster. Uh, bad things happen to good people, and that is why social safety net is uh, critical. Session one, session two, four on Social Security. For those of us who've labored in those vineyards of debt and deficits and budgets and who have taken the position that maybe fixing the Social Security solvency was easy relative to, say, some of the other social welfare programs, I guess the message was clear. We do not have a Social Security problem. We have a retirement security problem and we need a comprehensive national retirement income policy and we need to break down the silos that exist out there. Angela Glover's uh, Blackwell presentation yesterday message was very clear and very good and I believe as I say right on. If anyone is concerned about America's future, equity is a superior growth factor. A theme that I think ran throughout everything that I heard over the last uh, two days. Uh, if we're to redesign or design the social insurance programs going forward, we must always focus on the equity issues and fairness. Session two, the unemployment insurance panel yesterday, I think the takeaway for me was tweaking the UI or workman's compensation, a system that's in case of workman's compensation, 100 years old, 70 years old on UI. Uh, for today's new world, it will not work. Uh, Keynote professor uh, Theta this morning, 
I think it's absolutely clear it is worthy. It's a great thing. It's healthy. It's good. It's fantastic that we have this dialogue here, that it's a rich debate that's been going on for 100 years as it relates to these, these policies, but implementation to secure a society that it, it has increases the freedom uh, of, for individuals and family, it's critical. Health care reform is the law of the land. The takeaway I have, as Larry was suggesting, it is not perfect, but it is the foundation for advancing the historic debate of, uh, of, of ad 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 uh, addressing the security of those individuals' health and welfare. So my conclusion very briefly is to state the obvious. Uh, the world has changed since uh, many of these programs that we work with uh, have come into existence, whether 100 years, 75 years, 45 years, or even just a year ago. Uh, the world is, uh, uh, is completely different. Uh, life is different, different uh, uh, labor forces, different demography, uh, different delivery systems, and much different fiscal pressures. But what hasn't changed, as you can see from this last discussion, is we still have a federalism form of government and have to work within the framework of states and uh, states out there. So social insurance policies must change, is my takeaway here. If, they do, if they're to face today's challenges as the conference head, but also more importantly, if they're to face the challenges going forward. Nasty conference such as this and uh, with the honest and fair dialogue of differences of opinion here I thought was very helpful and will give us, NASI will continue to be a leader in moving forward with addressing these changes. So let me close with that uh, old uh, Churchill comment about how you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've done everything else. I think that's where we're headed. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. You're almost done. Uh, over the course of this conference, uh, the expanded importance of our shared focus could not have become more crystal clear. We know that now more than ever, in the wake of the worst recession that this nation has seen in some 80 years, the need for and the maintenance of social insurance programs could not be more critical. It is my hope, though, that as we leave this gathering, our shared commitment moves on with regards to continuing the fight, not only to do this work, but more broadly to change the narrative. He who controls the boundaries of the debate, I believe, ultimately wins the debate. And it seems to me that too often we have conceded the starting point of discussion to those who would seek to damage or more forthrightly seek to even end many of the programs that we fight for so stridently. Thus, I would challenge each of us to shift the narrative around social insurance from the parameters of a deficit reduction framework to a framework that puts at the center of our reality the people to whom these programs are supposed to be serving and in fact do serve. I find it maddening, frankly that today the immediate needs of millions of Americans are somehow consistently ignored. Their concerns seemingly routinely sidelined in order to focus like a laser on what has become known as the quote unquote deficit crisis. No doubt the deficit is important. But the real crisis is the 22 million people across this nation whom today find themselves without a job. The real crisis is the 44 million people across this nation whom today live in poverty. The real crisis is the $11 trillion in wealth that Americans all across the spectrum have lost over the course of the foreclosure slash equity reduction meltdown and the implications of that wealth loss on their long-term economic stability. These issues represent, in my opinion, America's real crises. And placing these people and their daily struggles at the center of what we do is the first order of business for shifting the dynamics of the broader policy discussions from one of mitigating losses to one of adequately meeting the needs of those who would otherwise do without. This is our charge for changing the course and truly living up to the theme of this conference of not only meeting today's challenges, but meeting those challenges well beyond this specific day. Thank you so much and thank you for attending the conference. So looking out at these uh, really remarkable panels of the last couple of days, 
Uh, a couple big themes struck me. One is, and, and Theda Scotchpold, I think, put it well, about the American approach to social insurance, which weaves together uh, a, a kind of cultural pattern in America and a set of practices both in our employer uh, communities and our kind of broader society. And one part of that is a persistent unease with government. And it gets expressed in a, in a lot of different ways, but certainly a deference to markets to play an important role. And you think of uh, uh, other countries that are affluent democracies, a much greater role in the provision of organized uh, benefits, whether it's retirement or uh, un, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, obviously uh, health insurance. Um, but, uh, and, and in a kind of, uh, on the other hand, an expectation that government will step in and play a role. And it's remarkable across so many different perspectives how many times, sometimes implicitly, you would hear that anticipation, well, of course, the markets can't do this. Uh, we just saw it in this last panel. Uh, and when you start going through the elements, for instance, of just the health reform bait, even though the phrase health care reform continues to divide Americans about evenly, the main components of reform are enormously popular, uh, whether it's you know, focusing on the donut hole, uh, on, on prescription drugs or extending uh, a coverage to uh, 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 younger uh, Americans and to those who lack insurance. And so we have in America uh, a, a kind of duality uh, in our culture and our practice that I think was really well captured in this conference between an unease with government and a deference to private markets on the one hand and yet a kind of operational liberalism that when it really comes down to concrete things that individuals need to both uh, uh, have economic security and then opportunity, the government has an enormous role. Uh, and, 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 and I think we can sometimes lose sight of that, particularly given the acrimonious and, and sometimes very ideological debates. Um, I want to close because this is uh, an anniversary for NASI, and I haven't been around for the whole time, but I've been around for, for quite a bit of it. And I wanted to just uh, note a couple things. One is it strikes me that one of the extraordinary things about NASI is its role as a connector. There are just lots of different communities who come together at these conferences and in the study groups, and also diverse perspectives. And Bill and Avis both touched on this, but that strikes me as really a vibrant uh, element, because we're too much, uh, frankly, uh, self-selecting. We self-select into communities that basically silo us. And so you hear a conversation in which really opposing points of view have just been blocked out based on the invitations and choices about uh, where, where to kind of uh, gravitate for, for uh, policy and intellectual and kind of work uh, reasons. NASI breaks through those barriers and it brings together diverse perspectives from diverse audiences and uh, uh, backgrounds. That is, I think, essential and, and should continue. It's also uh, the products that are being produced by NASI. This, the, the health insurance exchange report this morning is just one example of the constant role that NASI is playing in bringing together different stakeholders, different experts, uh, and, and providing a, a fact-based set of options for policymakers at the, at the national level and in the case of health reform at the state level. This is essential and doesn't really go on as often as, as one might hope, particularly given the new uh, um, kind of foundation environment and, and environment for funding this kind of work. It, it's increasingly rare, unfortunately. And then I will just say this. I think uh, sustaining an organization, uh, there's a famous poet who said, survival is a form of resistance. And sustaining an organization for 23 years, that is a big statement. And uh, you know, NASI staff is incredible. I've known Pam for a very long time. And I, I just want to say, uh, Pam, uh, there have been some rocky times. And as I look through this history, at least the 20 years that I've been around NASI, very, very impressive. And I want to thank you for that organizational leadership and the continuance uh, under what are sometimes rocky waters. So thank you very much. Go home safely.